today we are talking about the impact that the destruction of habitat is going to have on birds specifically and we're joined today by Steve Masters who's been camping at Jones Hill Wood which is one of the woods in the Chilterns that is threatened to be bulldozed and pulled up by HS2 virtually any day now frankly and um, very kindly David Lindo the urban birder and Nicola Chester who's a, another columnist for the RSPB um, have joined us to basically give us some insights on how does the bird population our precious bird population that's under so much pressure already with reduced habitats and pesticides and everything um, but when, when Steve's going to show us the beautiful hedgerows as well as trees that are going to be pulled out, how do the birds survive this kind of destruction? So Steve, do you just want to give us a quick shot of the hedgerows? Yeah, sure. So I'm just on the um, outer limit of the, of the ancient woodland and um, surrounding the ancient woodland there's, there's a lot of um, hedgerows which wildlife birds and some of the mammals such as badgers use for their, uh, for their feeding and for moving around the, the landscape. So um, you can see here, it runs down to the valley and the woods that you can see just on the, uh, on the, rhyme, on the left of the picture um, is where there's a whole load of badger sets. So I'm just gonna walk down the, the hedgerow now and just give you an idea of the different uh, species that we've got. There's hawthorn, um, blackberries, um, <clears throat> there's even some honeysuckle in some of the worm, some of the, uh, the hedgerows um, around here. And, um, and, and they, they are basically the, the highway um, for, for the badgers especially. So you can see there's, a, there's an opening there, that's a badger trail where they go through to get to the uh, to the other side of the hedgerow. And so, are they, and these these are very old hedgerows, aren't they, Steve? Yes, they're 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 probably as old as old as the woodlands, I would imagine. Um, they take, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Nicola. Hedgerows take years and years to become sustainable, and you know, and get the different varieties of of um, you know tree and plant life in there. So. I think they can age them from the number of species that are there. We've got um, elderberry bush there. So, and I think um, on the other side, you go down, there's actually slow berries as well. So, it, you know, it's, a, you know it's, it's full of diversity. And um, yeah, in fact, there's some slow berries there. So, so focusing on, on birds, there's all sorts of species of birds who would use this hedgerow as where they feed, where they roosts where they nest and raise their families I'm guessing? Yeah so up to um, up to 30 at least 30% of um, bird species will use hedgerows and probably more if, if, you, um, if you think about the, the areas of underneath hedgerows. 80% um, of woodland bird species use hedgerows as well um, throughout the year um, and we've got the migrant species that come in as well. Um, but it's all the other species as well, the insects, the, the whole food chain, they are the ecological putty that holds this landscape together, any landscape together. Um, there are connectors and corridors between inhospitable areas, um, they connect the woodlands, they're absolutely vital. So what happens, David, when, when these machines and men rock up one day and just pull it all out? What happens, I mean, especially this time of year, HS2 were meant to do all this destruction, I think, in the winter. Well, for whatever reason, that's not happening. They're doing it now. So there will be birds nesting in, will they still be kind of living in these hedges now and have to fly away and be absolutely terrified, I can imagine. And what, where do they go? What happens to them? Well, the thing is, it's now late July. So most birds would have finished their breeding. They may still have fledglings around but they will finished the, the bulk of their breeding season. Um, any hedgerow, any, any hedgerow anywhere is a loss if it's, if it's destroyed. There's a woman I know who lives in Guildford, and so she's got a lovely garden that backs onto some fields. And during lockdown, she casually told me, oh, I just chopped my hedgerow down. Why? Oh, well, I just, I just want to tidy the garden. Why? 
you know, and it's not birds ne- best thing in there. Well, how do you know that? You know, so it's 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 terrible. And there's lots of species, and I'm sure Nicola can actually add colour to all this. But it's lots of species that have really suffered because of hedgerow destruction. Um, the one that sticks to mind or comes to mind immediately for me is yellowhammer. Um, they used to breed in uh, in London, uh, my part of London. I, I come from northwest London. Well, uh, I was in Wembley actually. But they used to nest, you know, not too far from me. And, you know, they just went because of the actual destruction of habitat. And it's a problem. The thing is, I mean, that particular hedgerow, by the way, Steve, it looks amazing, that place. It's really beautiful. Uh, and that's another saddening thing to think that they're going to destroy that. And I hope they haven't given you the line they've given us, which is, we'll put it back to how it was before. You know, <laughs> it's just ridiculous. And also, um, these hedgerows, I mean, I've got one <coughs> not too far from me in Wembley called Friend Country Park and I've got hedgerows there that date back to medieval times and they're impressive hedgerows, they, you know, some of them are like seven foot tall now and you know, you've got less, you've got lesser white throat, common white throat, you've got reed buntings even in there, um, you've got all sorts of species that use these, these uh, hedgerows, the biodiversity as Nicholas said is immense. So if they come in and bulldoze, um, it's not a question of the birds are kind of just living there and they'll have nowhere to live. They'll, they'll move on. They'll have to move on. Uh, some species um, are going to probably have difficulty uh, next season in terms of finding territories because the, the territories that could be available could be occupied already by members of their own species. And other species like house sparrows um, are colonial and once they get to a certain level where their, their colony has been sort of decimated, they disappear, they don't actually move on and just disappear. So they just effectively die out. Um, and in terms of migrants, well, migrants will come through and find that it's not there and have to move somewhere else. But all, all, that, all of that sort of stuff, you know, adds to the pressure of finding food, basically. Mm. It may not seem much to HS2, one hedgerow, but one hedgerow added onto another hedgerow, added onto a block of woodland, added on. It's a massive chunk of our countryside, of which we haven't got much at all, that's natural, being killed off. So it's a sum, it's, a, it's part of the sum total, you know. I, I think locally, I mean, even at my patch, one of the scrubs, you could argue, yeah, but the birds can find some mustard. Yeah, maybe they can. But that's not the point. The fact is there is colonies and important breeding habitat and, you know, feeding and resting habitat there. Why are you destroying it? It's part of a bigger picture. Mm, mm. I mean, as you say, it might just be one hedgerow, but actually it's part of a puzzle. And if you take too many pieces of that puzzle out, the infrastructure of what's left for the wildlife is just not sustainable. So, Nicola, you, you mentioned that you, you describe these birds as refugees. Once their habitat's been destroyed, they've got to try and muscle in on someone else's turf. And, you know, that's going to put stress on other populations of birds. It, it is. It, I think when it gets to the critical level that it, that it actually is at, you know, as David said, we, we, we've lost so much. Um, and the countryside isn't always a friendly place for wildlife with the, you know, hedge cutting or... Um, pesticides that we use um, that's you know that's, that's a whole other issue really but um, but it all conspires against them um, puts huge stress on them um, and it's finding it, it, you know shelter it's finding the food the energy to to find new places um, and the food you know that that in the hedge bottoms there will be hibernating space for all sorts of um, you know frogs toads snakes um, what else we've got hedgehog, hedgehogs voles or oh, food stuff for barn owls you know it just goes on and on and on once that's gone it's a whole ecosystem that's gone and and the people who live nearby presumably you were saying in, in london david you you notice the drop of species because of the loss of habitat close to the urban environment and i know in the chilterns people are worried that the places they visit well, a lot of the woods aren't going to exist anymore, but presumably the birds that they see in their gardens and in their homes, in the towns or in the parks, they, those numbers will start dropping off if the habitats around in the countryside are dwindling Absolutely. too much. It's been happening um, for, for decades. You know, we've lost in Britain so much of our species density, it's untrue. 
And I see that even more because I travel a lot. I go to Europe, I go to, to, uh, to similar habitats elsewhere and it's teeming with life compared to Britain. And really? I go to in Europe, for example, I mean, their farming practices are much more, much less intense than ours. And you are left with um, a biodiversity, which would have been what Britain had 150 years ago. So, you know, there's quail, there's corn crake everywhere. You know, there's lots of birds that have now since become extinct or are very rare in the UK. And even the ones that are still kind of common in the UK are much more common over there because they've had space to actually to exist. Mm. In the UK, which is really sad, and England in particular, is a fact that everything is chopped down within an inch of its life, you know, and there's hardly anything left. There's hardly any hedgerows left. There's hardly any woodland left. I mean, I, was, I, did, I remember looking at a fact the other day that Cambridgeshire has the least amount of woodland in the county of any county in Britain. Um, I think it's like 11% of it's now wooded or less wooded. And the UK has got a tiny percentage compared to other mm. countries in Europe. Mm. We're just enjoying. And when you have a prime minister who's basically saying build, 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 who doesn't give a damn about you know, any kind of ecology. He doesn't realize that what we're destroying is effectively destroying us. Mm. It's all about the bottom the dollar. And this, 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 whole, this whole thing is a vanity project anyway. It's a waste of time. We all know that. But they have to do it because they feel compelled that they need to do it. You know, I just find it very, it's very distressing. And, and what really upsets me is when they try, and I said before, when they try and come up to you and say, oh, don't worry, we're going to leave it as we found it. We're going to make it, you know, we're going to put it back like you know, we were never there. You know, hedgerows take, take, take centuries to establish. You know, woodlands take ages to establish. You can't just turn that stuff around like there's no problem. And also it's got to connect with everything else. And plus you've got to have the right sort of, you know, plants and replacements, what have you, to, to, to actually to, to bring it back to life again. So I, I, I despair. It makes me very kind of angry actually thinking about it. No, absolutely. I, I've got to agree with David there. I've, I've just stepped through the hedge onto, onto Bowwood Road, which Penny knows is the road that runs around the, um, past the Badger sets wood and up, up to, the, um, to the back of the wood. And there was, a, there was a bumblebee, there was a butterfly, there was a cricket that I didn't quite get. You know, the, it, it's absolutely teeming. You know, there's, there's, there's nettles, um, I'm, you know, and my lack of knowledge, there's yellow flowers, there's white flowers, <laughs> there's pink flowers. <laughs> um, you know, and we did a bat survey um, and we, you know, we've got seven different species of bat in the, in the area, um, in the wood and around on the farm that's been evicted any day now. And, you know, at least two of those are fairly rare. And, you know, it, it, you know where are they going to feed, you know, when these, the, you know, and as David said, they talk about replacing. There's actually very little mention of hedgerows in the HS2 mitigation document. They all talk about the woodland and the ancient woodland and how they're going to plant twice as many trees. I mean, they talk about planting trees, Steve. I mean... But that's not the answer because planting no. many more trees doesn't mean anything. All the trees no. are up the same age. There's no diversity, you know, there's nothing. You just Absolutely. end up with a plantation and yes, all exactly. at the same time. You know, it's ridiculous. Mm. On UB Bypass, um, road protests of the, of the 90s and I was there, can't believe that this is happening again. But, you know, um, they found the tiny Desmoomin's well snail, which would sit on my little finger, fingernail actually. Um, yes. And it was, yeah, it's fine. We'll just um, move their habitat. Well, you know, five years later, after the bypass was built, they were all gone. They didn't survive yeah. that move. And, and it was obvious to most of us why they wouldn't. So it sounds good. There's a lot of that sounds good in theory, sounds good on paper, but actually it's just never going to work. It's, no. No, it's the case that you can't really, you know, people talk about managing nature. I don't think you can manage nature. Nature you know, does what it wants. And if it can't do that, it, it's, you know, it's extinguished, you know? So here's another trail that goes up, you know, it's just crisscrossed mm. all the way up. 
so, so with with birds and um you know let, for, for the wood, I mean, there's a chance Jones Hill wood might be survived. I mean, for this, the Chris Packham um, legal challenge, you know, there's a miracle it might be that that is, is successful and that this, this woodland is saved. But so many woodlands have already been destroyed, um, primarily in the Chilterns. Um, is, is there anything that people can do who live in that area to support the birds that are now refugees because their habitats can they put more food out? Can they, you know, is there any kind of temporary habitats they can help encourage them for them? It's not, it's not like humans, human yeah. migrants. It's not like that at all. I mean, you know, birds move around. So some birds will die out, die, literally die, or they move. Who knows where they move to? Um, all you can do is just maintain whatever habitats we, you have still. And keep them going. There's no, you know, there's no way of judging or knowing where what birds are going. Well, sorry, where which birds are going. Mm. We don't know. That. We'll never know that. Mm. Um, it's just the whole issue of what they're doing is just ridiculous. And it's just, and the problem is, is trying to get more people on board. You know, not just the people who like us who care about it, but the average person in the street who doesn't realise that you know. This is part of what they have to do. This is part of their life, and they should be caring about this as well. And it's getting those people to care. The more people that can, um, you know, argue the case, the better. And I think that the problem is, and this is generally with conservation in the UK, it's looked upon by others as people who are just tree huggers, and kind of hippies, or what have you. And so what? It's only a couple of trees. Who cares? What people need to understand and relate to is the fact that this, every tree you cut down, nice butterfly by the way, every tree you cut down is part of us we're cutting. It's, you know, death by, it's certainly a death by a thousand cuts. Mm. People just don't get that. Mm. What's, what's just struck me walking up here, everybody, is just how many, you know, bumblebees, you know? Mm. You know, we talk about the bumblebees being lost, you know, across the country. There must have been twenty and twenty meters just in one on one side of this mm. this lane. Mm. You know the butterflies that David spotted. You know it. It, it, you know, it is truly heartbreaking. Mm. Mm. And I, I think, I mean, I can see that HS two in the north. You know, there's more of an economic argument for it. They need better rail connections. You know, I totally get that. It's that there is. It's there's a bigger issue to it not just the habitat that's being destroyed in the south, mainly in the south of England, or at least at the moment, I'm sure there'll be more destroyed in the north. But it's, as David was saying, on a human level, we forget how much in our psyche and as just as our, for our mental health, we need to have a connection with nature. And oh, yeah. it's only when it's taken away and it's, and it's too late and it's lost. And it really worries me, like, you know, families living in cities and no access to nature, what that, you know, how happy can you be on a long-term basis without nature? Yeah, I think that's, um, that's a really important point. Um, and I think that the lockdown COVID has, has shown us that. Um, it's given us this gift, I suppose, if you like, um, where we've, a lot of us have been forced to stay where we are. Um, and we've noticed nature around us. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, very very lucky and i feel very privileged to live where i do i'm at the foot of the north wessex downs um so i'm thoroughly spoiled <laughs> but um but i think it's it's shown us that actually we're hardwired to nature and there's a very good reason for that um lucy jones actually wrote this book here losing eden um and there's an awful lot of um scientific evidence in there about I mean I think I think the mental health benefits of being in nature um, are fairly well known now they're becoming increasingly well known um, but she mentions the science behind the physical benefits of nature and actually that even things like awe and wonder that the physical reactions it has on our on our bodies um, can give it can have years to our lives you know and that is actually living around trees um nature all around us so we need that we need whatever we're building whatever we're tearing up needs to be really well 
thought through and with nature at the very heart of it because that is also a human thing mm. um, and we need to make that change the trouble is it's all boils down to economics until you can put a value on this kind of habitat and the government says okay well if we destroy this it's going to cost us x billion um, i think it, i think it's already been shown that there, there is a there is a material value you know, in terms of the cost to the NHS and everything else. I'm sleeping for two hours longer every night up in my treehouse than I do when I'm back in the, in the you know, in the, um, the inside world, if you like. Um, you know, the benefit for me is, you know, I'm physically stronger. Um, my head's less cluttered, you know. It's, mm. you know, I can, I can testify that there is, you know, as, as, as your other two guests have said, you know physical and mental benefits you know mm. connecting with nature and we are and with eight bells we do the you know the forest school down at the this the discovery center in Fatcham, and it's one of our most popular activities for the members mm. um, and they get so much from it mm. um, and i'm you know, sure david with your urban birding perspective you know having any any appreciation of nature and from the urban environment must be so valuable for people and you must help so many people appreciate what's what they can yeah but you know as i say there's not enough people engaging um but having said that and i think um nicola made this point earlier lockdown has kind of unlocked people's um, engagement, which I hope continues, even though I'm a bit of a pessimist in many ways, but I know <laughs> humans have a very short term memory, um, things start kicking off and happening, happening for them. But um, I think now's the time to try and engage people and I think it's really important. I think what's interesting about lockdown, is quite of interesting because it was nice that people were engaged with nature, but then there was also a side that I saw which I was frightened by. Uh, I think next time, if we, well, hopefully we don't have another lockdown, but next time we can actually educate people more. Firstly, people sticking their phones into the nests of birds that they've found in their gardens, what have you. Oh, look at my, look at my bird, and it's on Twitter. But the thing is, you're disturbing the parents who made dessert. But more importantly, more kind of, I was a bit shocked by it when I actually sat and realised, was that people were mowing the lawns every five minutes, beautifying their gardens, clipping their hedges and clipping their bushes and stuff, when birds and other wildlife are actually nesting. They don't normally do that stuff until the autumn, which is fine, because then there's no birds and other wildlife breeding. So I think we, you know, next time that happens, we need to collectively to start, stand up and say, guys, before you actually go into lockdown, think about this, you know, let's connect with nature, but leave some of your areas to nature. Mm. and all that sort of stuff yeah absolutely I, I totally agree and I think I think we need to every opportunity we have we need to say to people look we have to put nature first we're in an ecological and climate emergency it has to be in everything we have to consider it in everything we do but yeah absolutely David so it's it's education basically people don't realize the threat they might be filming their nest they just don't realize the effect it might have well and i think that if you you know it's obvious that they're doing that and they want to connect to nature but they don't, they don't know how to mm -hmm. and it's up to us to tell people actually it's great that you are concerned you're interested but actually you can watch from a, from a distance and explain why you know and say to them, it's like someone sticking a phone in your bedroom or something, you don't want that. You might desert your bedroom. <laughs> <laughs> so people can follow you, David, on your social media and um, pick up lots of passion and information and insights. Yeah, I'm all about love and passion. You're right about passion. So it's Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram. You won't see pictures of babies, girlfriends, or families and stuff. It's all about what I'm trying to do in my life, is trying to engage people.